Tonight marks the final reading in our Poets' Voice series for this season, and on behalf of the Poetry Room, I wanted to thank you for being so supportive throughout the season. In Matvei Yankelevich's Boris by the Sea, to somewhat brutally paraphrase his masterful <laughs> Chekhovian sequence, the narrator spends a lot of time pondering why people need each other. They need each other to pick ticks off their back, apparently, and they need someone to lie beside them in the dark to know who they are in relation. Tonight is in many ways a feshrif for relation itself and the cognizance that comes of it. Our readers this evening represent two distinct incarnations of and relationships with contemporary American poetry. They also happen to edit two remarkably different amalgams of poets' voices, Poetry Magazine on the one hand and Ugly Duckling Press on the other. And their translations converge on two different manifestations of early 20th century Russian poetry, the neoclassical and the surreal. Ozip Mandelstam and Daniel Harms were also compelled by their encounters with different poetries and personas. Mandelstam's poetry was deeply transformed by his translations from other languages, translating some 19 books, including Dante, in six years. And Daniel Harms was, by all accounts, a kind of pessoa of polymorphous heteronyms. While this evening might seem like a strange meeting, as Wilfred Owen might call it, the capacity to convene unlikenesses and to be awakened and catalyzed by encounter is one of the strengths and agilities of our genre and of our readers this evening. As Wyman writes in his adaptations of Mandelstam, our whole lives sweetness lies in these meetings that we recognize. Please join me in recognizing Christian Wyman and Matvey Yankelevich who will be reading in that order. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the Woodbury Poetry Room. It's great to be here, an honor to be here. Does this sound OK? Yeah? OK, let me start with an admission. I do not speak Russian. Um, this project came about uh, as a sort of fluke. Um, my wife was reading Mandelstam. I had read Mandelstam for years in translation. She was reading him, but I'd never really responded, in all honesty. Um, except to the prose. I love the prose. Um, she was reading him, and uh, as is often the case in my life, I found myself reading something because I wanted to ha be able to have conversations with the people in my life. And uh, so I started reading it and uh, thinking about it with her, and gradually thinking that there was something that I was supposed to be hearing or could have faintly hear, because we had all the translations. Um, and all the prose, and something that I could hear but uh, wasn't there. I couldn't hear it quite in the translations. And, and so I just wondered what it, what it would be like to do, to do one, to do a poem. And I translated from Spanish, but uh, aside from that, and that was years ago, uh, aside from that, I hadn't done any. Um, and so I did this one poem, eight-line poem, an early poem by Mandelstam, and, and, uh, and gave it to her, and she was like, eh, it's all right. Um, and it was, it was, it was nothing, but, um, but it sort of sparked something in me. And, and shortly after that, I met the poet Ilya Kaminsky, who may be here somewhere, I don't know, is Ilya in? Um, uh, and, and Ilya and I had dinner together. Uh, he gave a reading in Chicago, and I, I tend never to go to dinners after, these, the, after the readings, and this one I went to. And he and I hit it off, and we had a great conversation. We had a lot to talk about. And, and one of the things we talked about was Mandelstam. And, and, um, and he promptly sent me some word-by-word -word versions of Mandelstam with transliteration so I, I could tell where the rhymes were. I could tell where the sounds were happening. I could tell what the sound, I could, I could sp you know, sound them out for myself. Um, and uh, I, I took off. Uh, I intended to do just a few poems, and it was a, just a way of staying in touch with Ilya, in all honesty, uh, because we were communicating back and forth all the time. Um, but it, 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 it acquired a life of its own very quickly, and I ended up doing this book. Um, Mandelstam was born, well, let me tell you a little bit about, 
the poems in this book. They are very much versions. Uh, the, the translator, the, the publisher insisted on calling them translations. I explained this in a note. Um, I wanted to call them adaptations, versions, anything but translations. But they insisted for marketing reasons, and I lost that battle. Uh, I did get to put a note in the back and explain exactly what I was up to. Uh, and, and there are some poems in here that do qualify as straight literal literary translations. I'm going to read a couple of those to start. Um, there are others that are versions in the way we think of versions, uh, you know, close, uh, but some veering away to get at the tone of the writer. Uh, and then there are some others uh, which really veer away quite far, as far as Lowell did in some of his versions, uh, where uh, my voice is part of the poem, very much part of the poem. Um, and I'll, I'll point out which ones those are. Mandelstam was born in 1891, died in 1938. He was, he was born in Wars Warsaw, actually, uh, but quickly moved to St. Petersburg. I'll give you a little bit more of his life as we go on. You may, most of you may know it, I don't know. Early on, he was part of a movement called Acmeism. And what Acmeism was, was a reaction to symbolism. And uh, it was an attempt to get rid of uh, that, that, the nimbus uh, that was around poetry. All of the, all of the what, what they saw, the acmeas saw as a kind of pseudo mysticism. Uh, and, and they wanted to, Mandelstam said, uh, the earth, everything is growing harder and, and man must be the hardest thing in existence. He must be as a diamond is to glass. And so they wanted to make these poems that were absolutely formal and formed and cut themselves into, into the air. They're also quite literary, so they often are about poetry or they're about uh, mythological figures. One of the ones I will read is like that. I'll read two of these early poems. This is from 1913 called Night Song. The bread is blight and the air's acetylene, wounds impossible to doctor. Joseph, by his own blood, bartered off to Egypt, grieved for home no harder. Unslaked sky, sleet light of stars, and the stallioned Bedouins, avatars of the day's vagueness and the pain of vagueness, close their eyes and improvise out of nothing more than the mist of events through which they've passed. Coarse wind, a horse traded for grain, small wars with sand in which an arrow was lost. And if the songs in search of earth, and if the songs in sold, then everything vanishes to void, and the stars by which it's known, and the voice that lets it all be and be gone. My night vision is not so good. And this one is also a pretty close translation called The Necklace. Uh, it mentions Persephone's bees. Uh, bees have mythological significance for Persephone, but they were, they were the, uh, actually her, her priestesses were called bees. And in this poem, um, they represent, I think it's pretty obvious, uh, the work of art. Take from my palms for joy, for ease, a little honey, a little sun, that we may obey Persephone's bees. You can't untie a boat unmoored. Fur-shod shadows can't be heard, nor terror in this life mastered. Love, what's left for us and of us is this living remnant, loving revenant, brief kiss like a bee flying completed, dying hiveless to find in the forest's heart a home. Night's never-ending hum, thriving on meadow sweet, mint and thyme. Take for all that is good, for all that is gone, that it may lie rough and real against your collarbone, this string of bees that once turned honey into sun. I 
One of the things I wanted to get in Mandelstam was a tone. I realize it's probably not his tone, uh, uh, but it's, it's something, it's not mine. Um, I wanted, a lot of his prose talks about, well, he, he speaks in one, at one point, I, I, I'm the only poet in Moscow who writes for the, uh, writes for the voice. Uh, all the rest are bitch pack writers, he says. He says, get away, away with all of you. I alone write for the voice. And what he meant was he, he composed very much in his head. Uh, late in his life, he composed completely in his head. And then his wife would memorize the poems, write them down, or you know, they, it, was, it, was, it was dangerous to have them written down. So his wife and friends would memorize them, and uh, a lot of the poems have come down to us that way. He was a poem of sound. He followed sounds to their, to their meanings. Uh, he thought actually of language as being the spirit that inhabited an object. Uh, and, and he thought poetry had the, the power to actually bring objects to life, to give them their life. I'll read you a little piece of prose. He was also a great prose writer. Things have come to the point where I value only the proud flesh around the wound and the word trade, only the insane excrescence. That's worth thinking about when you hear the rest of what I'm going to read in Mandelstam. And the whole ravine was cut to the bone by the falcon's scream. This is what I need. I divide all the works of world literature into those written with and without permission. The first are trash. The second, stolen air. As for writers who write things with prior permission, I want to spit in their faces, beat them over the head with a stick, and set them all at the table in the Hertzen house. This was a house for sort of a, a state-sponsored house for writers who wrote in approved ways. Each with a glass of police tea in front of him and the analysis of Gornfeld's urine in his hand. Gornfeld was a famous literary critic. There's a complicated story about plagiarism that Mandelstam was accused of involving Gornfeld, but we don't need to go into that. I would forbid these writers to marry and have children. After all, children must carry on for us, must say to the end for us what is most important to say but their fathers have sold out to the pockmarked devil for three generations to come. Now that's a little literary page. So that acerbic quality is something I like very much about Mandelstam. He's funny too. He's acerbic and funny and sharp and he's crazy. This is called interrogation. This is when Mandelstam's life began to get a little difficult. Not as difficult as it would be, but difficult. Official paper, officious jowls, unswallowable smells of vomit, vodka, cells, bowels, and all these red tape tapeworms gorging on reports. Choir stars, your highest, your holiest silences. But first, sign here on the dotted line that they may grant you permission to shine. Not one word. This is written right after this one. Not one word. Purge the mind of what the eye has seen. Woman, prison bird, everything. Otherwise, some wrong dawn, your mouth moves and a sudden pine needles through your nerves. A trapped wasp crazes in your brain and in the old desk's ink stain, a forest mazes inward and inward to the unpicked and sun-perfected blueberries where you now and now always must stand an infinite inch between that sweetness and your hand. So Mandelstam and his wife, Nadezhda, were constantly being forced to move around from place to place. She wrote a very famous, uh, two famous memoirs, uh, uh, Hope Against Hope and Hope Abandoned, which really made Mandelstam famous in the West. Uh, they're, they're great books, it was particularly the first one. Uh, also a great book, I, which I don't think many people read, called Mozart and Salieri, a little book about uh, creativity, um, uh, on, about Mandelstam and Akhmatova, which is very good, 
a tiny little book if you come across it. Um, they were constantly fleeing from place to place. And um, this is a poem written when they were in, in Moscow. Come, love, let us sit together in the cramped kitchen, breathing kerosene. There's fuel enough to forget the weather. The knife is ours, and the bread is clean. Come, love, let us play the game of what to take and when to run, of come with me and come what may, and holding hands to hold off the sun. This is another poem set in Moscow. Uh, it's uh, 1931. Um, Manistan was Jewish. His family was Jewish. Uh, he converted to Christianity when he was 18, I believe. There's a lot of debate about what that meant, uh, whether it was real conversion, whether it wasn't. Uh, a lot of Jews had to convert to Christianity in order to get work. He needed to go to school. And uh, if you were Jewish, you couldn't get into the school he needed to go to. But he converted to, to, very oddly, he converted to Finnish Methodism, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, it's odd for a couple of reasons. It's odd because it's so specific, and, and it's, odd, it's odd because that wasn't exactly a safe thing to convert to. And so it complicates matters a lot. Uh, I, I find his, his religious impulses fascinating, and, and I do think he was a religious poet in a way not a Christian poet. Uh, uh, the last poem I'll read especially brings that out. This is called Herzl verse. The, one of the things that I love about Mandelstam, the Mandelstam that I am able to intuit, is the range of tones. He can be wildly funny, and then he can be deeply serious. Uh, uh, he, he can write these political poems, and then he can write love poems, but he really did run the, run the gamut. Herzl verse. Once upon a time, there lived a Jew. A musical Jew, I tell you, named Alexander Herzovitz, sweet as Sherbert, his Schubert. A jewel, I tell you, a musical jewel, dawn to dusk, day after day, the same damn jewel in the same damn way. What is this, Salamander Slivovitz, Insanity's Sonata? And what are you, a holy fool? Scherzovitz, enough of it. Let the dulce de leche maiden swoon Schubert through her skin. Let the children slay Allegro this swiftness and darkness and star sparkled snow. We're not afraid to die, you and I, to flutter down like a dove, a musical dove, to hang on a black hook like a coat and glove, a worn, one-armed coat and a tattered, three-fingered glove. Oh, maestro, Alexander Herzovitz, whose hands and heart are blown to bits, what in you pins you there, my lonely mister, heaven's busker, playing your sad, your same, your only heir? So his most famous poem is the Stalin epigram. He didn't call it that, I don't call it that, um, but it was his most famous poem. He, um, he wrote it in, in 1933, and uh, either foolishly or very bravely uh, recited it to a literary gathering one night, um, probably at Pasternak's house, a lot of people speculate, but, um, uh, at the time, a lot of people had the ability, Mandelstam himself had this ability, he could, he could hear a, a, a poem one time and remember it. Uh, it, it. Everything rhymed, everything was metrical, he could, you know, it was, it was easier to remember. A lot of people had this gift. Someone that night apparently had this gift and either remembered part of it or enough of it uh, to report back to uh, Stalin, uh, Stalin's goons. Uh, this, no one knows exactly who did the reporting. Uh, and uh, that was it. That was it. Uh, Mandelstam's life after that point became quite difficult. Here's the poem, which is really a kind of, um, I take liberties with this poem, the, as the, the last one I read, I did. Um, uh, this, this poem is uh, almost a puppet show. 
He turns Stalin into a kind of, it's just a mockery. We live and love, but our lives drift like mist over what we love. Two steps, we are a whisper, ten, gone. Still we gather, we gossip, we laugh like humans, and just like that, our Kremlin gremlin comes alive. His grub worm clutch, all oil and vile, his dead weight, dead words, blonk, blonk. Listen, his jackhammering jackboots, even the chandelier shakes. Look, a hairy cockroach crawls along his grin at the cluck cluck of turkey lackeys, and he busts a gut at the wobble-gobble dance one does without a head. Tweet, tweet, meow, meow, please, sir, more porridge. He alone, his grub growing hard, goes no, goes now, goes boom. Half-cocked blacksmith, he lifts from hell's hottest forge his latest law, and with it brands a breast, a groin, a brain. And like a pig farmer who's plucked a blackberry from a vine, savors the sweet spurt before he turns back to his swine. Stalin didn't like that. <laughs> but he did not kill Mandelstam, not yet. Um, uh, he let him live for a while, and it's a bit mysterious why. Um, maybe to illustrate, he had this famous phone call where he called up Pasternak and said, is this guy really a great writer? And you know, Pasternak said that's not the, really the right question. Um, uh, but he had probably already made his decision to reprieve Mandelstam before that phone call. Uh, it, was, it was simply getting it out there, letting it be known that he was, in fact, a decent guy. Uh, um, there's no telling. But at any rate, he did live uh, another few years, luckily, because he wrote his best poems, I think. He wrote his best poems from then until his death. This is called Black Candle. It's one of his most famous poems. Your girlish shoulders are for blushing, for blushing under whips and in dawn's raw ice to shine. Your childlike hands are for pushing, for pushing flat irons and feed sacks and knotting twine. Your feet, infant tender, are for tiptoeing, tiptoeing through shattered glass in the blood tracked clay. And I, I am for you, a black candle burning, like a black candle I am burning and dare not pray. Let me end with this poem. Manostam and his wife were exiled uh, um, far away to, to Voronezh. And um, near the end of his life, Mandelstam was writing poems furiously, sometimes three or four a day, uh, uh, walking the streets, uh, having these things a attack him, really. Um, uh, he was. He felt the end upon him, but there is no trace of desperation in these last poems. That's not quite what you feel. What you feel is a kind of, I was going to say crazed elation, but it's actually sane. It's a very, it's a very uh, difficultly held, very precariously held, and fiercely held sanity. And it is also uh, a quality of being that I think you find in very little poetry that he says, I use it as an epigraph here. He said early in his life to exist it is a, is an artist's greatest pride. He desires no paradise other than being. I think of that and think of him writing this. This is the last poem that we have from Mandelstam. Actually, there, was, there, were, there were three written on this day, or two, depending how different editions present them differently. But uh, I've got them as three separate poems. Uh, think of being able to make this statement with that vice closing on you. Mandelstam died in a transit camp in Siberia, picking through trash, 
a garbage heap in, trans in Siberia, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. I mean, picking through garbage. Uh, this is the last thing we have. And I was alive in the blizzard of the blossoming pear. Myself I stood in the storm of the bird cherry tree. It was all leaf life and star shower, unerring, self-shattering power, and it was all aimed at me. What is this dire delight, flowering, fleeing, always earth? What is being? What is truth? Blossoms rupture and rapture the air, all hover and hammer, time intensified and time intolerable, sweetness, raveling, rot. It is now. It is not. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was really amazing to hear that. Um, it's, uh, I've only tried a little bit of Mandelstam myself, and even knowing Russian, <laughs> it's not easy. Um, doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to be reading from the work of Daniel Harms. Um, and actually, um, after long going back and forth uh, with Christina, I thought, Finally, maybe there is a poem or two of my own that fits somehow. Can you hear me okay? In the back? Okay. Um, okay. Um, it, it probably, unlike Mandelstam, probably a little bit more biographical information may be needed um, uh, for harms. Um, uh, it's uh, interesting that um, uh, Christina mentioned uh, what uh, this sort of difference of Harms and Mandelstam, almost contemporary writers, uh, Harms being a little bit younger, but dying about the same, in the same period. Um, and, uh, and it's actually interesting to see, and maybe this will bring some curious resonances out, how in some ways Mandelstam at the beginning seems like a neoclassical writer, and Harms, of course, an avant-gardist and possibly a surrealist. And then somehow things maybe cross sort of um, um, uh, cr cross path, they kind of cross in some way and, and, and Harms begins to talk a lot about order and, and actually uses the word neoclassicism to describe some of his later work, which is surprising given, as you'll see. But, but um, uh, and then Mandelstam's work in the 30s becomes so, so um, complex and, and surreal um, Black Earth and so forth in the Veronish notebooks um, uh, in, in, in a strange way also um, like Harms's work almost divorced sort of rooted in the reality of Soviet Russia but also sort of divorced from it in, in another way. Um, uh, but anyhow, um, Harms uh, born in 1905 and his friends founded uh, the la what's often called the last avant-garde collective of the early Soviet period, the Oberiu, uh, which stands for um, the Association of Real Art, Avidinenye Realnova Iskustva, which uh, this movement followed, of course, in the footsteps of avant-garde artists who they admired, like Kazimir Malevich, who they were actually friendly with, um, and Velimir Khlebnikov, uh, and many others. Um, Harms's idiosyncratic uh, uh, aesthetic theories centered around a belief in the autonomy of art from real, uh, real world logic and the intrinsic meaning to be found in objects and words outside of their practical function. By the late 20s, his anti-rational verse, was sort of based in uh, futurist Zaum to some degree, uh, and his non-linear theatrical performances <laughs> and even public displays of uh, decadent illogical behavior uh, earned him uh, a reputation of being a kind of eccentric or holy fool in a very different way. Um, uh, and um, uh, in, in Leningrad cultural circles, and, and that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Um, 
in the late 20s, um, the Soviet authorities having become increasingly hostile toward the avant-garde in general, deemed Harms' writing for children, and he worked as a children's writer, as many um, writers who would not pub publish most of their serious work in that time did. Um, uh, he, his work, his writing for children uh, was deemed anti-Soviet because of its absurd logic, its insistence on uh, nonsense and its reviews, refusal in the Lewis Carroll tradition and its refusal to instill materialist Soviet values. Uh, in 31, he was arrested and prosecuted for his involvement in the, a group of anti-Soviet children's writers, as absurd as that may sound. Um, and um, uh, along with him, Alexander Videnski, um, uh, whose work actually is coming out in a, a new translated edition uh, that Eugene Stashevsky and I worked on. It'll come out this spring, um, uh, a fairly complete volume, um, and a couple other uh, cohorts. Um, and he was in a, a short exile in 1931-32, and with the help of people like Gorky and some children's writers, bigger figures, he was, um, uh, he was permitted to come back to Petersburg. Um, after that, though, uh, uh, he was no longer going to perform any of his work in public. He found it increasingly difficult to publish even his work for children, uh, which had been his sole source of income, really, and became even more destitute over the next decade. I'm just going to read a poem from a notebook of his. This is how hunger begins. In the morning, you wake lively, then weakness, then boredom. Then comes the loss of quick reason's strength. Then comes calm, and then horror. Uh, so that's Harms writing in the about 37. Um, and uh, he lived in dead and hunger for several years. Um, and uh, during that time, he wrote for the desk drawer uh, with his, uh, and, and basically, f as in the Russian expression, for the desk drawer, and basically for his wife, Marina Malich, and uh, also his friends, the, the Chinari group, um, uh, and, and a small group that met privately to discuss philosophical and mathematical matters, and sometimes literary ones. Um, Harms, um, uh, uh, after th this difficult period, he was rearrested when just before the blockade of Leningrad began, when many people were s who had a political record were suspected of potential treason um, uh, at the beginning of World War II, and uh, he was imprisoned in a psychiatric hospital, uh, first in Leningrad prison number one, and then in the psychiatric uh, ward of that prison. Um, after probably having told the investigators uh, his unusual theories about <laughs> um, words and magic and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps maybe his last public performance. <laughs> um, and then uh, he died in a cell in uh, February of 42, probably of hunger. Uh, his work was miraculously saved by, the, uh, by some loyal friends and hidden until the late six, or mid to late 60s when his children's writing became, became actually started to be published again. And coincidentally, at that same time, this archive was, uh, 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 scholars began to look at this archive, private archive, um, uh, and, um, and to disseminate the work to the West and in Samizdat. Um, so um, hopefully that wasn't too boring for those of you who already know harms. Um, um, and edifying for others. <laughs> um, okay, so. Unlike Christian, I have, uh, I'm rather scattered. <laughs> so um, I have a bunch of papers and things to read from. Um, uh, it's hard to contain Harms' work in certain ways. I'll start with a poem uh, that Harms wrote um, for a children's magazine. Um, it's not like Mandelstam's poem um, in, um, uh, about Stalin in that there's no clear reference to the contemporary period um, uh, to a man had left his home one day with bag in hand and metal bar and off he went and off he went a stroll that took him very far he walked on straight and forward and always looked ahead he never slept he never drank he never stopped to eat or drink 
nor even rest his head. And once upon a morning dawn in darker woods he fared, and from that time and from that time he vanished in thin air. But if perhaps your path with his just happens to be crossed, then quick as you can, quick as you can, run quickly telling us. And this poem was not very, uh, didn't do him any good in 1937 either. Of course, of course, it sparked, it sort of smelled of something, um, something a little bit um, as though it referred to the, the disappearance of certain of his own friends, many of whom had, who had worked for the state publishing, a children's publishing house. Although in other ways, this may just be a poem in the limerick kind of nonsense tradition. Um, so, um, and uh, Harm says children's literature is somehow intertwined, of course, with uh, the work that's, that was not published in, uh, in children's magazines. Would you like me to tell you a story about the Critchen? No, not a Critchen, uh, but a Chikritchen. Or no, not a chakruchin, but a chakruchin. Fui, not a chakruchin, a charcuchin. Of course it's not a charcuchin, but a chuchu kritchin. No, that's not it. Chicky kratin, no, not chicky kratin. Kuchi kitchen, no, wrong again. So I've forgotten what's this, what this bird's called, but if I hadn't forgotten, I would tell you the story about this chukukukukuchin. Prayer Before Sleep, March 28th, 1931, at seven o'clock in the evening. Lord, smack in the middle of the day, a laziness came over me. Permit me to lie down and go to sleep, Lord, and while I sleep, O oh Lord, pump me full of your strength. There is much I wish to know, but neither books nor people will tell me. Only you can enlighten me, Lord, by the way of my poems. Wake me up strong for the battle with meanings and quick to the governance of words and assiduous in praising the name of God for all time. How easy it is for a person to get tangled up in insignificant things. You can walk for hours from the table to the wardrobe and from the wardrobe to the couch and never find a way out. You can even forget where you are and shoot arrows into some small cabinet on the wall. Beware, cabinet, you can yell at it. I'll get you. Or you can lie down on the floor and examine the dust. There is inspiration in this too. It's best to do it on a schedule in conformity with time, although it's difficult to determine the time limit for what are the time limits of dust. It's even better to gaze into a tub of water to look at water is always good for you and edifying. Even if you can't see anything in it, it's still good. We, we looked at the water and saw nothing in it, and soon we got bored. But we comforted ourselves that still we had done a good deed. We counted on our fingers, but what were we counting? We didn't know, for is water in any way countable? Um, in the same notebook as that hunger poem is this poem, or this um, sort of uh, note to self. It's from the blue notebook, number 25. Enough of laziness and doing nothing. Open this notebook every day and write down half a page at the very least. If you have nothing to write down, then at least following Gogol's advice, write down that today there's nothing to write. Always write with attention and look on writing as a holiday. Blue Notebook number 16. Today I wrote nothing. Doesn't matter. <laughs> January 9th. I like that it's important what day it is. Um, um, Mm. 
not now. This is this, that is that. This is not that, this is not this. What's left is either this or not this. It's all either that or not that. What's not that and not this? That is not this and not that. What is this and also that? That is itself itself. What is itself itself? That might be that, but not this, or else this, but not that. This went into that and that went into this. We say God has puffed. This went into this and that went into that and we have no place to leave and nowhere to come to. This went into this. We asked where? They sung an answer here. This left that. What is this? It's that. This is that. That is this. Here are this and that. Here went into this. This went into that. And that went into here. We watched but did not see. And there stood this and that. There is not here. That's there. This is here. But now both this and that are there. But now this and that are here too. We long and mope and ponder. But where is now? Now is here and now there and now here and now here and there. This be that. Here be there. This that here there be I we God. <laughs> Since we're into the theoretical a moment. Um, I'll read uh, something from a letter um, that he may have or may have not sent to uh, uh, to an actress he was in love with. I do not know how to express that power in your in you that brings me such joy. I call it simply purity. I thought about how wonderful is all that is first. How wonderful the first reality. The sun is wonderful, and the grass, and the stone, and the water, and the bird, and the beetle, and the fly, and man. But just as wonderful is, but just as wonderful is the drinking glass, and the knife, and the key, and the comb. I don't just make a boot. I am creating a new thing. It's important to me that in it there should be the same order that is in all the world that the order of the world should not suffer, that it remains pure. This is the purity of order. The pu this purity is the same in the sun, in the grass, in man, and in poems. True art stands in rank with the first reality. It creates the world and is its first reflection. In all these cases is the same purity and consequently the same nearness to reality, i.e. To, to independent existence. Now it isn't just words and thoughts printed on paper. It is a thing as real as a crystal inkwell standing in front of me on the table. It seems that these verses have become a thing and one can take them off the page and throw them at a window and the window would break. That's what words can do. So he's telling her about how he writes poems or how he wants to write poems. And this uh, idea of the new thing, um, very much a constructivist idea in a lot of ways, um, in, the, in a Malevich idea, um, brings me <laughs> modestly <laughs> to this poem, uh, which I think I have time for. Um, you know what, it doesn't leave me time, so, um, what? Oh, no, I, I'll, that's all right. <laughs> well, okay, I'll read it. <laughs> all right, uh, Christina has convinced me once again after my floundering. Um, okay, so I, I think this, this thing, this new thing that Harms talks about, it is a little bit um, just hinted at here in this letter is uh, something that he talks about a lot and, and the, uh, or that the Oberu, the Association for Real Art talks about in their, sort of manifesto, um, and that is um, the, this Oberu object, which is in, which um, actually is kind of a, um, it, it comes back in a lot of his work through the 30s too. So I tried to create a, um, a kind of Oberu object. 
buttons. This text is written on buttons so tightly sewn to each other that no one can read it. Clarify. This text is written on the inside side of many buttons, all of which are sewn together in a necklace of buttons so that you can't even see the text. In fact, the beaded and contiguous nature of these buttons makes it impossible to even know which side of each button is its inside side. In the necklace of buttons, sides don't matter. Every side touches is in contact. Even so, the text is written only on the inside side. The side which was once in contact with was touching the clothing people wore, the clothing of the people who once wore it but now do not wear the clothing because it does not have buttons. During the war, all the buttons fell off. Those that didn't fall off were cut from the clothing of the people. No, the buttons no longer touch the clothing. Instead, they touch each other on all sides. Buttons have two sides and two sides only. At least these buttons. No one can read this text. It's on the buttons and the buttons touch, and so there's no room for an eye to get in there in between the buttons. No, the buttonholes don't help either. They're stuffed with thread, the thread that keeps the buttons touching. These buttons are a sort of entertainment, you might say. Their holes are full of thread, their, t their sides touch. Not even imaginary characters can read the text, not even a, a thought experiment. Boris can't read it, even if I asked him to. Benita Canova can't read it. Nor can Nietzsche, the hysteric one can't, and the ontological one too. The buttons are so close together, you can't even unbutton them. You can't even imagine them. These are real buttons. My friends can't read the buttons, and you? I don't even know my friends, because on one side they are my friends, and on another they're somebody else's friend. Yours, maybe, their own, definitely, imaginary, perhaps. Yes, buttons, the buttons. I've never been so afraid of buttons. Um, so that's a little homage to the Oberyu, I guess. Um, um, so moving from there, I have had this idea um, to move to a different aspect of Harms's work a little bit. A peculiar thing, um, <clears throat> I should say this is a sonnet in 14 sentences. Sonnet. A peculiar thing happened to me, I suddenly forgot what comes first, seven or eight. I set off to ask my neighbors what their thoughts were on the matter. How great was their surprise, and mine too, when they suddenly realized that they also could not recall the counting order. One, two, three, four, five, and six, they remember, but what comes next, they've forgotten. We all went down to the commercial store called Gastronom that's on the corner of Znamenska and Baisenia streets and asked the cashier there about our incomprehension. Smiling a sad smile, the cashier extracted a small hammer from her mouth and twitched her nose slightly. She said, in my opinion, seven comes after eight, but only when eight comes after seven. We thanked the cashier and in utter joy ran out of the store. But after we had pondered deeply the cashier's words, grief came over us again, for it seemed that not a word of hers made any sense to us. What was there to do? We went to the summer garden and began counting the trees there. But when we reached the number six, we stopped counting and began to argue. Some thought seven was next in the order, others eight. We would have argued very long, but luckily, just then, somebody's child toppled off a park bench and broke both of its jaws. This distracted us from the argument. After that, everyone went home. Um, so here, um, had we the time, we could talk about the serial aspects of Harms's work. But I'll read a poem that somehow follows that that number poem in a, in a different way, in a different way. Um, um, 118. A certain Pantelier hit Ivan with his heel. A certain Ivan hit Natalia with a wheel. A certain Natalia hit Simeon with a muzzle. A certain Simeon hit Silifan with a wash basin. A certain Silifan hit Nikita with an overshirt. A certain Nikita hit Roman with a board. A certain Roman hit Tatiana with a shovel. A certain Tatiana hit Yelena with a pitcher. And a fight broke out. 
Yelena beat Tatiana with a fence. Tatiana beat Roman with a mattress. Roman beat Nikita with a suitcase. Nikita beat Silifan with a serving tray. Silifan beat Simeon with his bare hands. Simeon spat into Natalia's ears. Natalia bit Ivan's fingers. Ivan kicked Pantelier with his heel. Ack, we thought, good people fighting each other. Um, another sequential poem. This actually has come out in a form of a children's book. But the, the artist very s smartly says at the, in the back, and, and I, I had nothing to do with that, but I wish I had written this bio. Daniel Harms wore a hat to protect his ideas from being seen. This is true. He smoked a pipe to appear English. He was Russian. He wrote 20, ch 20 children's books. This is not one of them. I wish I had written that about him. <laughs> um, with translation, as, as Schleiermacher says, translation is the art of understanding, and I think that sometimes understanding hinders you <laughs> in certain ways. But um, uh, so Harms uh, wrote this thing that may have been a, a kind of children's story. I've, shown, I've given this to children, and they're a little bemused. Because of her excessive curiosity, one old woman tumbled out of her window, fell, and shattered to pieces. Another old woman leaned out to look at the one who'd shattered, but out of excessive curiosity also fell and shattered to pieces. Then a third old woman tumbled from her window, and a fourth, and a fifth. When the sixth old woman tumbled out of her window, I got sick of watching them and walked over to the Maltsev market, where, they say, a blind man had been given a knit shawl. <laughs> Events. One day, Arlov stuffed himself with mashed peas and died. Krilov, having heard the news, also died. And Spiridonov died regardless. And Spiridonov's wife fell from the cupboard and also died and the Spiridon of children drowned in a pond. Spiridon of grandmother took to the bottle and wandered the highways. And Mikhailov stopped combing his hair and came down with mange. And Kruglov sketched a lady holding a whip and went mad. And Pirichostov received 400 rubles wired over the telegraph and was so uppity about it that he was forced to leave his job. All good people, but they don't know how to hold their ground. The fable is one of harms, or the, the the fable with a um, or the story with a moral to it that isn't really a moral is one of his favorite forms. A fairy tale. There once was a man by the name of Simeonov. Once Simeonov went out for a walk and lost his handkerchief. Simeonov started looking for the handkerchief and lost his hat. He started looking for his hat and lost his jacket. He started looking for his jacket and lost his boots. Well, said Simeonov, at this rate, I'll lose everything. I'd better go home. On the way home, Simeonov got lost. <laughs> no, Simeonov said, I'd better sit down a while. Simeonov sat down on a rock and fell asleep. The Four-Legged Crow. Once upon a time, there lived a four-legged crow. Strictly speaking, it had five legs, but that's not worth talking about. <laughs> One time, the four-legged crow bought itself some coffee beans and thought, so I've bought coffee, now what do I do with it? <laughs> then, to make matters worse, a fox ran by. It spotted the crow and hollered to it, hey, it yelled, you, crow. And the crow yelled back at the fox, crow yourself. And the fox yelled at the crow, you're a pig crow, that's what you are. <laughs> the crow was so insulted that it spilled the coffee. And the fox ran off, and the crow climbed down to the ground and went home on its four, or to be precise, on its five legs to its lousy house. Um, so, So uh, this translation business is kind of a funny thing. Lots of people have 
many people have many different ideas, as many ideas as there are people probably about translation. Mm. And um, I, for one, um, very much like what Schleiermacher says about um, when he, he urges us not to leave, um, not, um, not to leave the reader in peace when we are translating uh, and to move the writer toward um, where, where what, if you leave the, trans leave the reader in peace, you're moving the writer toward the translator. I'm sorry, toward the reader. <laughs> the translator is moving the writer toward the reader. I'm confusing you on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, and, and he urges instead the translator to lead the reader to the writer, um, uh, and uh, and it, it's it's a curious um, thing to try to do that. Um, so he says that translation is somewhere between paraphrase and imitation. It's and it's always an in between, um, and. Um, in more current times, um, much is being said about um, uh, the alleged translator's invisibility. In other words, the practice of translators to step away from the responsibility of being there and kind of pretending that the text you're reading is the original. Um, and also the problem with criticism, which never in the US mentions the translator except to say it was, it was a good translation because I didn't notice it. <laughs> um, and, um, and so people like Lawrence Venuti and others, uh, translation theorists, are talking about uh, the problem of the translator's invisibility. And I'd like to just point out that I'm here right in front of you as a translator, <laughs> which um, I'm, I'm pleased to. I think this is one of the ways, by creating such series um, as this one uh, and such readings, that translators actually are there. They're, they're not going to just disappear <laughs> um, and, and are, are there to point out this, this very interesting fact of their existence. Um, Harm says, translations of different books make me squeamish. Various and sundry and from time to time even interesting stuff is described in them. At times it is written about interesting people, sometimes about events and other times simply of this or that insignificant incident. But it happens that sometimes you read it and can't understand what it is you read about. It happens like that too. And then you come across such translations that are impossible to read. What strange letters. Some are okay, but others are such that you can't tell what they signify. Once I saw a translation in which not one letter was familiar, some kind of squiggles. For a long time, I turned the translation this way and that, a very strange translation. <laughs> and I'll just read. Um, I think three more pieces. Is that good? Are you all still with me? <laughs> Anyone needs to run away? It's OK. No, I'm missing my page. Sorry. OK. Another uh, type of letter. You see, the forms Harms uses are very classical sonnets. Later, I'll read a symphonia next, um, um, and um, letters and fables and fairy tales. Dear Nikander Andreevich, I received your letter and understood right away that it was from you. First, I thought, what if it's not from you? But as soon as I opened it, I knew it was from you. But I almost thought that it wasn't from you. I am glad that you have, been, have long been married because when a person marries the one whom he wanted to marry, that means he has achieved that which, we, which he wanted. Also, and so I am really very glad that you got married because when a man marries someone he wanted to marry, that means that he got what he wanted. <laughs> Yesterday I received your letter and right away I thought that this letter was from you, but then I thought it seemed that it wasn't from you, but I unsealed it and saw it was certainly from you. You did very well to write me. At first, you didn't write to me, and then suddenly you did write, although earlier before you didn't write me for some time, you also wrote to me. And as soon, um, as, soon as I didn't write, uh, sorry, as soon as I received your letter, I decided right away that it was from you, and that's why I'm very glad that you had already married. Because if a man wants to get married, then he must get married no matter what. 
That's why I'm so very glad that you finally married precisely the one you wanted to marry, and you did very well to write me. I was overjoyed when I saw your letter, and right away I thought it was from you. Although, to tell the truth, while I was opening it, a thought flashed through my mind that it was not from you, but then in the end I decided that it was from you. Thanks for writing. I am grateful to you for this and very happy for you. Perhaps you can't imagine why I'm so happy for you, but I'll tell you straight away that I am happy for you because because you got married, and married precisely the person you wanted to marry. And you know it is very good to marry precisely the person you want to marry, because precisely then you get what you wanted. And that is precisely the reason that I am so happy for you. And I am also happy that you wrote me a letter. Even from afar, I knew that the letter was from you. But when I took it in my hands, I thought, and what if it's not from you? And then I thought, no, of course, it is from you. I myself am opening the letter and at the same time thinking, from you or not from you, from you or not from you. And then when I opened it, I could clearly see that it was from you. I was overjoyed and I decided I would also write you a letter. I have lots to tell you, but I literally didn't, don't have any time. <laughs> what I had time to tell you, I have told you in this letter and the rest I will write, to you, write you later because now I have to, no time left at all. At the least, it's good that you wrote me a letter. Now I know that you've long been married. I knew too from previous letters that you got married and now I see it again. It's completely true, you got married and I'm very happy that you got married and wrote me a letter. As soon as I saw your letter, I knew that you had got married again. Well, I thought it's good that you got married again and wrote me a letter about it. Now write to, t write to me and tell me who is your new wife and how did it all happen? Relay my greetings to your new wife, Daniel Harms. Sinfonia number two. Anton Mikhailovich spat and said, Ech, spat again, again said, Ech, spat again and said, Ech, again, and left. God bless. I'd better tell you about Ilya Pavlovich. Ilya Pavlovich was born in 1893 in Constantinople. When he was still a little boy, he was taken to Petersburg, and that's where he went to the German school on Kirichnaya Street. After that, he worked at some kind of store, went on to do something else, and at the start of the revolution, he moved abroad. And God bless him. I'd better tell you about Anna Ignatyevna. But it's not that easy to tell you about Anna Ignatyevna. First of all, I know nothing about her, and second of all, I fell off my chair just now and forgot what I was going to tell you about. <laughs> better, I'll tell you about myself. I'm tall, rather bright, and dress elegantly and with considerable taste. I don't drink, don't attend the races, but I am drawn to the ladies. And the ladies don't try to shirk me. They even like it when I stroll with them. Serafima Ismailovna has invited me over many a time. And Zinaida Yakovlevna also said that she's always glad to see me. But with Marina Petrovna, I had a curious incident, which is what I want to tell you about. The incident was really quite typical, but still curious, for thanks to me, Marina Petrovna went completely bald, like the palm of your hand. It happened like this. One day, I came over to see Marina Petrovna, and bang, she went bald, and that's all. <laughs> um, and lastly, I'll, I'll read um, uh, a text that has some cult status. Um, Harms wrote it at least twice, the same text, <laughs> once in the blue notebook and once in a notebook that he titled, uh, it was kind of a homemade collection t uh, titled uh, Slucci, which means incidents or events, uh, chance events. Um, and uh, so I'm reading you the second, or at least uh, as far as I know, the second version. Um, and, uh, but in this version, he retains the original title. Blue Notebook number 10. And afterwards, I'll read it to you in Russian. Uh, Blue Notebook number 10. There was a red-headed man who had no eyes or ears. He didn't have hair either, so he was called a redhead arbitrarily. He couldn't talk because he had no mouth. He didn't have a nose either. He didn't even have arms or legs. He had no stomach. He had no back, no spine, and he didn't have any insides at all. There was nothing. So we don't even know who we're talking about. We'd better not talk about him anymore.
Был один рыжий человек, у которого не было глаз и ушей. У него не было и волос, так что рыжим его называли условно. Говорить он не мог, так как у него не было рта. Носа тоже у него не было. У него не было даже рук и ног, и живота у него не было, и спины у него не было, и хребта у него не было, и никаких внутренностей у него не было. Ничего не было. Так что непонятно, о ком идет речь. Уж лучше мы о нем не будем больше говорить. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Christian.